So with that, um, we are going to begin the Song of Solomon. And today is just going to be the introduction, as you saw in your notes, and I labeled it introduction. And Dan goes, oh, that's a really cool uh, title. It's like, yeah. But so we can also say, here we go. And to get us kicked off talking about uh, uh, relationships and marriage, and we'll see, you know, sexual activity as well in this book, um, I went to the authorities of love and marriage, and that was kids. Um, you can never go wrong when you're talking about love and marriage and ask kids what they think about it. Uh, and so here we go. Here's what kids think about love and marriage in general. This is what Manuel says. He's age eight. He says, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. All right? John says this, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Interesting take from dude's perspectives, right? Pain and run, all right? I don't know. Uh, here's a question. How do you decide who to marry? How to decide who to marry? Um, this is what Carolyn says. She says, my mother says to look for a man who is kind. That's what I'll do. I'll find someone who's kind of tall and kind of handsome. I'm like, all right. This one might be my favorite out of all the ones I picked. Um, you got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports. <laughs> oh, there's more. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the kid that said that was J.T. Santini. <laughs> I trained him well, didn't I? <laughs> Just kidding, he didn't say that. I didn't train him that way. All right. And then finally, Kristen said this. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all the way before. That's good theology from this 10-year-old. And you find out later who you get stuck with. So, <laughs> so we kind of enter the Song of Solomon with a little bit of laughter, humor, um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a book that probably many of you haven't been taught. Maybe in bits and pieces you've heard it taught. But how many of us have been through a, a Sunday morning service, and we started in chapter 1, verse 1, and we went through the Song of Solomon and all the chapters? Raise your hand if you've been through the whole book. Yeah, there's like maybe, what, 10% of you. And that's probably about par for the course for a number of reasons. But uh, it's the Word of God, so we're going we're gonna to preach it uh, for a number of reasons. But... As we begin this new series, The Song of Solomon, as is our habit here, we go pick books of the Bible, go line by line, verse by verse. Um, who is excited about going through The Song of Solomon? Raise their hands. Raise them up high and proud. All right, yes. So you see a little bit there. Who's a little nervous that we're going through The Song of Solomon? Yes. And why are you nervous? Because I'm teaching it and you kind of know what I could do. Like I said, Rita and I talked, and I said, there's not going to be any ad-libbing. I'm going to stick to the notes because I could get in trouble. But um, I'm, I'm excited, and I'm also nervous, too, uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, I've been putting extra time in studying this book. Actually, for the last month, I've been, I've been going over it. And one of the reasons why I'm excited, because this is God's Word. I mean, it's in his canon. It's in the 66 books. He, by his Spirit, wrote it and decided to put it in his Word for us. So that's one reason why I'm excited. He's, he's the one that's created gender and relationships and marriage and, and roles and passions and, and sensuality and sex. And do you think he would give us those desires and those relationships and not give us kind of a, a manual, a how-to? Give us like, hey, this is what marriage and relationships and how to pursue a marriage and relationship should look. And when you get into that, uh, what, what, what it should produce so that's why he's given us the Song of Solomon. So that's why I'm excited about it. He's given us a manual to learn how to enjoy romance, passion, marriage, and sex to its fullest. I'm also excited because we live in a culture that is very confused about these topics, don't we? And, and because we have God's truth, we, we can equip ourselves to see what God's highest standard and demand and joy and how the author, the one who created, now we can go and share with the world how to enjoy it. Because there's a lot of people out there that just don't know. 
They don't know God's design. They don't know God's best for relationships, marriage, and sex. So uh, I'm excited because there's people that desperately need to hear about the message in the Song of Solomon. And he's going to use you and me as we go through this sermon to go out and share the goodness of God in these topics. So what an incredible opportunity we have to be a light with our friends and our family, our co-workers uh, we come in contact with because it's a hot topic in our culture. And so we get to arm each other with the truth and to do that. But not only do the outsiders need to hear it, uh, all of us in here need to hear it. Those who are in the church, we need to hear these truths because um, let's just be honest, uh, some of uh, the marriages in here are, are struggling a little bit. And, and they need to hear the message of romance. They need to hear the message of marriage. Some of us in here uh, are single, and you're pursuing uh, relationships. Well, you need to know how to do that with honor and with integrity that brings glory and honor to the Lord and it will bring you the most joy. You need, to, you need to know the characteristics you should look for in a spouse. That is in the Song of Solomon. And so this this. This is a book for all of us in here. This is a book for all of us in here. And secondly, so that's why I'm excited for it, but I'm also a little bit nervous because as I look out among this group of people, I know that every single one of us has a different experience in these topics, in the, in the matters of relationship, uh, the matters of marriage, and the matters of, of, of sexuality and sex. And there's a lot of different thoughts. There's a lot of different grids in which you guys all come with. Uh, with the, the joys in some instances, and some with the pains that come with these topics. And so it's a little nervous because, because, again, all of you have different experiences, and, and we want to be faithful and try and hit those. Now we can't. And so when we go through the Song of Solomon, we're going to have some great general principles, um, and we're going to get specific in some areas, but we're not going to hit everyone at every little detail. And that's why we've created some other things to, um, to help out with that. So I'm a little nervous because of that. Because what I want to do is I want to be sensitive to those that you've been abused or maybe hurt in some of these areas. Uh, we, want, we want to share the truth of God's Word with, with love and grace and sensitivity. And at the same time, not to shrink back from God, what God's Word says, but to come and share the truth of God's Word. Because for many of us in here, it's going to be healing. For many of us in here, it's going to protect us from making mistakes. And for any of us in here, it's just going to continue to, to reiterate the joy in which we need to continue to pursue in our relationships. And so again, because of the variety of experiences, um, I'm a little nervous. So again, um, here we go. We're going to in, be in this together. And so because of the variety of experiences, we're thinking of ways on how to, we can best shepherd and meet your guys' needs in there. So we'll probably uh, have a couple panels, uh, maybe after some of our Sunday mornings, and we'll have you guys, you know, text, email, write questions. We'll have some panels up here after the Sunday gathering, whoever stays around, and we'll just have some more heart-to-heart, maybe dive even a little bit more into some particulars. Um, we're going to have some, maybe some opportunities for, for counseling. Maybe some of you are going to recognize, man, we need help in our relationship. And so come to us and let us know, and maybe we can, we can set up some times to meet with you. We have a lot of good couples in here that love to walk alongside life with you. And then just as, as your pastors, I mean, grab one of us. We'll be kind of milling around here after the sermons, and uh, grab one. If you have questions, grab us. Come talk to us. We'd love to walk through uh, this topic and these topics with you. So that's why I'm excited. Um, also, there's going to be a couple, couple times... Those of you with parents, in particular with those that have kids in here that are in the fourth or fifth grade, um, there's going to be a couple chapters in which we're going to see this couple come together and consummate a marriage. They're going to make love. They're going to have sex, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the topic of the sermon. And so we'll have maybe some extra classes if you feel it might be a little bit um, inappropriate for your kids right now. Um, this sermon, I said as before, it's going to be PG-13. Um, it's not going to be rated R, but there's going to be some pretty intense, erotic passages that we're going to talk about. And so um, let's talk about them. Let's not be ashamed. And so um, those are just a couple preliminaries before we get going in the book. So here we go. Today, today we're just going to spend some time introducing the Song of Solomon to you. We're just going to cover verse uh, 1 of chapter 1. And then we're going to do a little overview of the author's style, theme purposes. And then we're going to go back and look at Genesis 1 and 2 briefly. Uh, because I think that's going to set the stage for us jumping into the Song of Solomon. So turn your, if you uh, haven't already, to the Song of Solomon. We're going to be on page 
page 560 in the ESV. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you, around you. We're going to be in verse 1, chapter 1. And this is what it says. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon. So what we see first off is who's the author? Who wrote this book? And it's my conviction that it's the Solomon. Solomon is the one who wrote the book. And uh, now there's some, there's actually a lot of people that don't agree that uh, Solomon wrote the book because when they look at Solomon, they go, how can this guy write anything on relationships and marriage? And we know why, don't we? Because uh, in his lifetime, he was associated with a thousand different women. First Kings tells us that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So how can this guy talk to us about uh, the glory of God in relationships and marriage and being in a monogamous, faithful covenant marriage. Makes sense. So that's one of the reasons why uh, people don't think that Solomon wrote the book. And there's a couple other reasons. But for us and our people, I believe with many other commentaries that Solomon did write the book. Uh, his name is mentioned seven times in the book. But I believe when he wrote it, it wasn't in the middle or at the end of his life when he was running with all these women and all these wives and all these concubines, but it was at the very beginning of his life. And in fact, um, there's a possibility that um, who he is talking about is this young handmaiden named Abishad, this Shunammite in 1 Kings 1 and 2. And so if you get some time, write that down and read in, in, in 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2 about this story. It's really a drama about this young Shunammite that was probably um, Solomon's uh, first wife and, and the girl he was writing about in this book. Uh, it's a pretty cool story. It's basically, let me just give you the overview. David's old in his age, so he's old. So this young lady comes to be his, uh, his servant, his maid, to take care of him. And she is very beautiful, it says in 1 Kings. And uh, Solomon just might have a thing for her. But Solomon's older brother, David's about to die. So David says, Solomon, you're going to be the new king. The older brother wasn't picked to be the new king, which he should have been, but he wasn't. So there's some, some tension there between Solomon and his older brother, Adonijad. And so um, he's free out because David might kill him, and all of a sudden, Adonijah says, so, so I, look, I, I want to show that I, I, I don't want to freak um, Solomon out. I'm not trying to go after his throne, but can, um, uh, he goes to his, his mom Bathsheba, uh, can you tell Solomon to give me this Shunammite, this lady Abishab, as my wife? And what does Solomon say? Sure. No, Solomon kills him. A little family tension in there. Now, there's a reason why is because um, it, it indirectly uh, this request might be Adonijah trying to get the throne uh, because there was a thing back then if you if you married one of the king's you know the the the, the king's uh, servants you were on your way to the throne so there's a little bit of a thing there but possibly Dave uh, Solomon had the thing for Abishab and so this is what. Uh, could possibly be the story about. This could be who David, I mean, who Solomon is writing about. So, so Solomon wrote, even though there may be some, some disagreements, but Solomon wrote. Now there's some, a lot of different interpretive issues with the Song of Solomon. In fact, it's probably the toughest book to, to interpret. Uh, there's like seven different views on how to interpret this book because it's laden with just a lot of imagery and poetry. And nowhere else in the Old or New Testament is the book ever quoted. And in fact, they use, in, in these um, short uh, eight chapters, um, Solomon uses about 40 to 50 words that we can't find anything about in history. They're only used here. So it's a very tough book to kind of you know, interpret what Solomon is trying to get off. And, and so let me just cover the, the main, two, main two that you've seen throughout history. One is the one that we're going to focus on. The other one uh, that has been really known since the early church fathers up till about the 19th century was the way people interpret this is through allegory. Uh, it's purely symbolic, metaphorical, there, but it's about a deeper spiritual issue. Um, it's not necessarily about uh, a historic relationship, but it's about God and Israel or Christ and the church. And this is all symbolic, pointing to some of those um, areas. People like Charles Spurgeon and the Puritans uh, held to this. Uh, and, and so this is how they would kind of translate it. Literally, again, no, literally no literal meaning. So they take like um, Solomon, uh, Solomon, Solomon 1, 13, and if you look there, it says, My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. And they would look at it like that, and they said this is how they were interpreted. That the breast of the woman is the Old and New Testament, 
and Jesus lies in between. And you're like, that's weird, you know? Uh, and, and that's it. There's just, there's just no way to say, yeah, that's what it means. You, you, in allegory, you can't, there's nothing to contrast it with. So that's one way. Um, and we're not going to go that way. We believe it, it, the redemptive literal approach is the way we're going to walk through it. And we believe that there's a historic reality. There's really a, a relationship between Solomon and the Shunammite woman. It's, it's just as real as my, my, my marriage with my wife, Rita. Um, and the general progression that we're going to see is that love is lifted up, the pursuit of marriage. We're going to see them get married. We're going to see them consummate the marriage. We're going to see them fight. And, and it does ultimately point to Christ, but it's primarily about God's good gift on what relationships and marriage and sex should look like. It's about first and foremost Him giving us a manual to show us what this good gift is and how we best use it to glorify God. And in that, as in all relationships regarding around love, in particular marriage, uh, throughout Scripture, the theme, marriage always points to Christ's love for his church. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5. When he's talking about the roles of men and women, and husbands and wives, he says, the mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ in his church. And so it will point us to that. D.A. Carson says this, used illustratively, the song says some beautiful things about the relationship with Christ and his beloved bride, which you are reminded, among other things, of the strength of Christ's love, his delight to hear prayers from the church, his invitation of Christ to share in his company, and the dangers and failures to respond to Jesus' knocking. So it, it does point, we can see Jesus in this text, but again, the overarching purpose of this book is the excellencies of love regarding the pursuit of marriage between Solomon and the Shunammite woman, this great gift that God has given us. So that's the purpose. So over the course of the next seven and eight weeks, we're going to unpack this, and we're going to see this couple uh, attracted to one another. We're going to see them have this anticipation for intimacy with one another. We're going to see them pursue one another in this dating, courting relationship, whatever word you want to use, with honor, integrity, and that brings God glory. We're going to see them get married. We're going to see them consummate the marriage and, and make love to one another. We're going to see them fight, and we're going to see them make up, and we're going to see ultimately their dedication to each other in a lifelong commitment in the covenant of marriage. So that's kind of the brief introduction of where we are going with this book. And so it's going to be pretty exciting. Now, some of us in here, again, it's going to speak to all of us, um, singles and married couples. Let me just address the singles real quick, um, why you shouldn't check out of this book. And we already touched on some of them, but the majority of you will probably get married. That's the desire of your heart. And so this is good to give you practical ways on, on how to pursue a spouse. It's going to give you some real practical, specific principles on what you should look for in a spouse and how to go about that. Um, you're going to understand on what marriage is. So you can look for a spouse that shares the same biblical view of marriage as you do. And so you don't start out marriage as like a house divided, you know? Like one of you wants to see you and one of you wants to see us you, right? And you're going to get married. You know, it's, we don't want to start out unequally yoked. We all want to start out on the same page. And finally, if you're single, the Lord can still use you to speak into uh, marital couples because we're talking about God's Word. And you are filled with the Spirit. You have God's Word, so you can speak truth even though you haven't been married into our lives. Jesus is the ultimate authority on marriage, and was He ever married? No. Same with Paul. And so you guys can help undergird the marriage relationships here at the crossing. And so that's just a couple of things why you singles need to kind of just dial in and not check out in this study because it's very important to you as well. And then for married couples, it's important for us. Like I said, so some of us are, are on some maybe some thin ice, and we need to hear these truths of God that's going to save our marriage. Some of us are, are, have, a, have a good marriage, a decent marriage, and we never need to get settled or focused. We need to always focus on the foundational principle. So this book, again, is for all of us. So Again, back to verse 1. So we see Solomon wrote it. We see the purpose. We see how we're going to interpret it. And then it says, the song of songs. And so what Solomon is communicating here at the very beginning is this is his best song he has ever written. We know in 1 Kings 4 that he's, he penned over 1,000 songs. He was a songwriter. So like back in my generation, he would have been like the Bob Dylan of his day, you know, 
the Bob Marley of his day. For some of you younger generations who don't know who those guys are, he would be like the, the Taylor Swift of your day, all right? Or the, the John, John Legend of your day. You know, he was a songwriter, and he loved to write psalms. And, then, and Solomon says, this is the best one that I've ever written. Out of the thousand I've written, this is the best of the best. It's kind of like when it says song of songs, he's emphasizing the same way like in Revelation 19, where it says Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and what we're saying there is, is Jesus is the highest quality. He's the highest expression of what a king and the Lord is. And what Solomon is saying, that this is the highest, the greatest expression of what a love song should be. And I would say not only is this the best song that Solomon's ever written, but it's the best song to be ever written ever. Now, I know a little something about love songs. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Um, I'm, I'm kind of an expert in love songs. I know I have this tough experience, and you guys know my, my background. But you can ask my wife. I'm a pretty romantic guy sometimes, all right? And so, but back in the day, in the 80s and the 90s, some of you guys that, that grew up that are going to resonate with me, we had to make mixed cassette tapes, right? Who knows what I'm talking about? Raise your hand, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, what that would be for you younger generation, like what is a mixed cassette tape? I had to put cassette in there because if I just said mixed tape, you probably would be like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? It's kind of like your favorites list on your iPod or on your iPhone right? It's, except for us, we didn't have just one device. We had like a multiplicity of different tapes for each little genre that we wanted to listen to. So like I had tapes that I would listen to like before games that would get me focused and geared up. I had tapes like if we're going to go on a long trip, I'd, ha- I'd have, you know, certain other playlists that I would have on this tape. And, and, and when Reed and I were dating, I'd have, I have, the, I have our, our tapes to get us in the mood when we go out on a date, you know? And uh, yeah, I had some nicknames for those tapes, but I, again, I'm not going, I'm just not, I'm sticking with my notes. I'm sticking with my notes. All right? But, I, I, you know, I, and I have my like classic rock love songs, you know, so I had like Journey, I had like Boston, The Scorpions, you know, Heart. That was my classic rock, but Rita wasn't like a classic rock lady. She was like more like an R&B kind of lady. So, so I had my Brian McKnight Oh, yeah, yeah. Sade, uh uh-huh. Boys to Men, Whitney Houston. Some of you younger guys need to be writing down some of those names right now and (laughs) and looking them up on Spotify, all right? In particular, Brian McKnight. Now, so so this, when I was doing some research on love songs, I typed in the greatest love song ever. And Billboard magazine said the greatest love song ever, ever was Endless Love. Who remembers Endless Love? Lionel Richie, Diana Ross. And then it was redone by Luther Vandross and Mariah Carey. And that was a song at Rita and I's wedding that we danced to. So I know a little bit something. I picked the greatest song, you know, for us to dance to back in our wedding, right, 20 years ago. And like I said, I've been studying the book of Song of Solomon. And there's all this romance that's going on in this book. So I thought, oh, okay, I got to see if this still really works, you know. So Saturday morning, I get up early, I do some more studying. Rita gets up, she comes in, she sits on the couch. I said, babe, hold on. We start doing a little chit-chat. Get on my computer, my computer's right there. I pull it up, endless love. Hit play. Song starts. I get up, I said, can I have this dance? Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right, dudes, did you hear all the ladies go, aww? You guys better start bringing some pen and paper because there's going to be some good stuff in here for you, all right? You're going to be like, oh, I need to write that down. Yes, you do. Okay. And so we danced. It was just me, her, and our dog, Wallace. <laughs> and Wallace was constantly trying to bite my hands because he, you know, he's being protective. But the problem was my hands were on my wife's butt, and so he was biting my wife's butt. No. But did it work? Did it work? She goes like, I'm crying. I was just like, oh, <laughs> booyah. So now, but in all that, Solomon says, this is, the, this is even better than endless love. And, and in fact, there's no song that, that anyone can come up with that's going to reach the integrity, the passion, the sensuality, the emotions, the love of the Song of Solomon. 
And I think after we get done walking through this, we're all going to agree. It's like, oh yeah, this is a romantic book. So that's chapter one. That sets up the introduction. Real quickly, I like to take us back to Genesis chapter one and two to kind of set the tone, tone even more for this book. Because I believe if we're going to understand more about this book, we need to be reminded about why God has created us the way He has created us. And so we're going to begin in Genesis 1 and 2. We know in Genesis 1 1 it says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So the, the sovereign, all-powerful God of the universe created everything in heaven and on earth. And we know one of the things that He created on day 6 was us. He created male and female. He created men and women. Uh, two, two species, yet we were equal, yet we're different in many ways. Genesis 1.26 says this, then, the, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. And then we turn the page to Genesis chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit gives us a little bit more detail on how the Lord created men and women. And first we see that God first created man. And he gave the man a name, Adam. Now, not only did he give him gender there as a man, but Adam is also uh, important because he is our representative. And Adam means mankind, man, humankind. And so in Genesis 2, 7, we read this. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So what do we see? We see that first that, that man was created differently than the rest of creation. In the rest of creation, God just spoke and it was so. Moon, sun, spoke into the existence. Land, sea, divided, spoke. Plants, animals, spoke, created. But when it came to man, he didn't just speak. He grabbed some dirt, maybe grabbed some water, sprinkled it on there, maybe spit on it and put it together. And he created man. He fashioned man with his own hands, like a potter fashions clay. So there's intimacy involved. And he created us. And then he gave us the ability when he breathed life into us, the capacity to think and to create and to speak and to love. God stamped man with his image. And we see that when he, complete, um, when he made him, man was completely formed. That's crucial. God not only gave man the typical, you know, two eyes, two arms, two hands with ten fingers on it, two legs with feet, but he also gave man one external sexual organ. And then God also gave man a heart to pump blood, a stomach to process food, red and white blood cells uh, internally, but he also gave the man the ability to produce this hormone called testosterone. And sperm that is created in his testicles. And after he got done completely forming man, he gave him a job. Name the animals, right? So there he is. He's naming the animals. And verse 18 says, and when Adam got done, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I need to make him a helper fit for him. And so God made Eve. He, he laid Adam down to sleep, you know, the first lullaby in all the world right there, and he pulled out of Adam's rib and made Eve. Eve, her name means life. And so when you bring Adam and Eve together, what you get is mankind, human life. So it's a beautiful picture of God creating life. And it says Eve was made different from the creation as well. She was formed from a different material than Adam. Adam was dust and from the ground, and, and Eve was made from Adam's rib. But in the same way, by the hands, God fashioned her. And in the image of God, he fashioned her. Except God formed Eve a little different. I mean, the basics were the same, the head, two arms, legs, ten fingers, ten toes, etc. But her structure was what? A little smaller. Her hips were what? a little rounder. Her breasts were a little bigger. He created her a little bit different. He also gave her a physical sexual organ, but it was quite different. And yet, it was the perfect complement to the males. 
And it was the same with Eve. Internal makeup, heart to pump blood, stomach to process food, red and white blood cells. But there was something different. She produces a, a different hormone, estrogen. And that each month she re- routinely drops an egg from her ovaries for a specific purpose. And it was done. And she was fully created and fully formed. And so why do we need to begin there? We need to begin there because we need to remember that this was God's creation of Adam and Eve. He created gender, and it was good. And it was not only to be used for procreation, which it was, the creative mandate, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, that was part of it, but it was also for pleasure and intimacy between a husband and a wife. We need to remember that the the enemy, Satan, didn't create sex. We need to remember that it wasn't the result of the fall that we have the certain organs that we have. It was all created before the fall. Genesis chapter 2, this was God's design. He's the one that created you, uh, male and female, differently for very specific purposes, and it was good. It was God who put the testosterone in the man so when he would wake up from his nap... He would see Eve, and he would sing at the top of his voice like, woman, you know what I mean? Because when he woke up and he saw Eve, he's like, oh, you don't look like an elk, you know? (laughs) It was like, oh, yeah, you know? And what we have here is we have the best-looking humans to ever walk the face of the earth in Adam and Eve. And then we see immediately after he woke him up, there was a marriage. It says this in Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Most people stop there. Except, in particular, when Rhea and I do premaritals, we also focus on verse 25, because it's in the Scripture. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed by the way the Lord created them. In fact, they enjoyed their differences. They enjoyed their roles that were different. They enjoyed their emotions that got different, that gave them that were different. And they also enjoyed each other physically. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that 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 is God's design. Um, God created us completely before the fall. But we also know that sin did enter the world, and it has reaped havoc on men and women with regards to uh, relationships, marriage, sex, and sexuality. And because of that, we tend to, even here as Christians, we tend to be ashamed about these topics. We tend to not want to discuss them. Even in the home, we, we tend not to discuss them because we're embarrassed to talk about these things with our kids Sometimes we're even embarrassed to talk about them between each other as husbands and wives. And we're certainly embarrassed, as the majority of you raised your hands, you didn't hear about teaching through the Song of Solomon about in the church. Because we have this idea that comes from Plato that the soul is good, but the body is bad. So what we tend to be heard have been taught even throughout the ages, and maybe why mostly the commentators... uh, uh, interpreted this through allegory was because the grid in which they were going off of was that sex was dirty or unhealthy or just a necessary evil to procreate. That would be like one of the prevailing themes of human history and the way we viewed sex, and that seeped into the church. And so we're like, shh, we, don't want, we can't talk about that. You know, we can't say the word breast in church because, oh my gosh, you know. We can't say, that's why I use sexual organs and not other words right now. Because I know some of that would be like, oh my gosh, people couldn't hear the rest of what we're talking about because you said those words. Because we've been conditioned a certain way to say, oh, that stuff is bad. And it's not the case at all. That's why we began in Genesis 1 and 2, because it is good. God has wired and created and given us specific organs for specific purposes. And so that's how we want to approach this, that God's original design for procreate, what is for procreation, but also for pleasure and intimacy between a husband and a wife. And we need to talk about it. One of the reasons why we need to talk about it, because the enemy in the world is constantly talking about it, aren't they? They're constantly bombarding us with 
images on selling hamburgers and watches and all kinds of other things that have, you know, with sex. You, you go to the grocery store and you just look at the titles on the front covers of all these magazines. I mean, you got you to gotta cover your kids' eyes if you really read those because it's just laden with sexuality and the philosophy that is of the world. So we want to combat that. That's why we're going through the Song of Solomon. We want to hear God's good design and purpose for marriage. And we want to start a dialogue. And that first dialogue might be begin with you and your wife right now. That first dialogue might be with you and your kids right now. That first dialogue might be with singles right now. Did you know it's okay to talk about sexuality if you're single? And we're going to get into that because most of the time you go into church, they say, like, singles, don't even talk about it. Why? Because that might heat up the emotions and you guys might fall. And then what happens is all of a sudden you get married and you're like, we never talked about it, so you don't know what to do, and it's like train wreck, right? Some of you are going through that like right now. It's like, what are we supposed to do, you know? You're like, that's what we're going to talk about. It. So I'm excited for us to talk about it. I'm excited for us to get in the Song of Solomon because God, through his Spirit, has given us this book. And it's a book of hope. It's a book of joy. It's a book of enjoyment. And ultimately, it's, again, a book about God's glory and what our relationships should look like and how we should enjoy them. So therefore, I don't want to be ashamed when it comes to studying the book of the Song of Solomon together. I want us to celebrate it, and I want us to enjoy it. What God has called and created us to be as men and women in the context of relationships, in the context of marriage, in the context of sex. I'm going to end with this proverb right here, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 18. It says this, Three things are too wonderful for me, for I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, and the way of a ship on the high seas, and finally, the way of a man with his maiden. Let's pray. 